Okay, so we are starting on kind of the last bit, and this is sort of the appropriate segue in 1080 that we everybody in here has to take. A big chunk of what you're going to do in 1080 is this. So, uh, like I said, a big chunk of 1080 uh, will be dealing with integration. Um, so, what we're going to do here is we're going to set you up for it, uh, tell you what integration is all about. A lot of what you do in 1080 will just be over and over kind of application. It's just like you did application to Drift, you'll do application to this. I'm also going to do a little bit extra. There are basically two techniques of integration, basically. Uh, and I'm going to get you through actually both of them before we finish the course. So you can see it's Canadian, it won't be the first time. So, like I said at the beginning part of this class when we started, uh, there are two big problems in calculus. One you spent most of your time dealing with, and that was the problem of finding the tangent line to a curve, right? That seems simplistic, but we've seen that there's a lot of applications, tangent line to get velocity, uh, and basically any way to change. Second major problem is this. Suppose I have some function at max, and I want to know this point A, B. I want to know what is the area under this curve. I will be able to get sort of an exact thing to what that area is, right? And oh my gosh, I'm so close because I've got three straight sides, don't I? Flat bottom, two straight sides. The problem is I've got a curvy top. Um, what do you already know? For what kind of functions could you figure out exactly what that green area is? What, what kind of function could I find exactly the area? That's right. If this was a horizontal line, you could do it, right? Because it didn't just be a rectangle, right? That you can do. In fact, I could do something a little bit more general. In fact, you could do this. You could do it if it was any time. Right, because now the root, root is slanting, but at least it's Straight. So this is a rectangle and a triangle. So I could figure that out. Everybody agree with that? There's one kind of curve that maybe you could also do. If I had this, or if I know. Then I can do it, right? Because everybody knows the theory of a circle is, right? But by the way, how do you know what the area of a circle is? Because your teacher in good grade book, right? And it's kind of like both the work. I bet your teacher didn't prove it, did they? They just said, oh, this is the area of a circle. Well, with this, we will eventually be able to see exactly where that form comes from. This matter. So here's what we got. If I have a straight, a flat root, even if it's tilted, I can figure out the area. If I've got a semicircle root, it's functional to tell me what the area is. But if I've got some function here, it's all curvy and whatnot, geez, I'm not sure anymore. Okay, so let's quickly sort of give up on that idea just for the moment. You all are mostly engineers, scientists, and whatnot. What do you do if you can't get an exact answer? An approximation, right? I mean, we can do this. 
I mean, um, so let's try an approximation. And it is from this approximation that we will get an exact answer uh, or at least the idea behind how to go about it. So how do we do this? Well, here's the idea. Suppose you have Outback proximity of this curve, uh, uh, or the area under this curve. Well, one thing I could do is I could use boxes, right? I mean, so here's an approximation I can do. I can just put this black roof over everything. Would my approximation be too big or too small? Be too big. And I can also go down here. Approximation would be probably too small. I could take those two approximations and add them. Another thing that I can do, another approach might be this. Let's break this up into four pieces. And let's use the right hand end. So this box, this box. This box. So here I have four rectangles. And I can just add up the areas of those rectangles and approximate the area of one third. Everybody agree with that? Everybody agree with that? Is, is it exactly right? I'm not sure, but you have to be lucky for it to be exactly right. Everybody agree with that? Notice that this box is too big for its width. This box is too big, and these two are too small. Now, I might get lucky and have the too big and the too small cancel out perfectly. I doubt it, but I would think this would be some kind of reasonable approximation, right? But what if you're a total perfectionist, right? What if this approximation is not good enough? What if you want to do better? How could you do better? Well, instead of using four boxes, you use 16, right? You do this. Well, this is good as compared to the previous, right? This one seems to. Notice this approximation is better than just the four boxes, right? Because the, the four red boxes inside the original black box are a better approximation. Everybody agree with that? And these four inside here are a better approximation. It's not quite as excessive as these first two. And these ones sort of cover some of the missed ground here a little bit better. Everybody agree with that? 16 boxes are better than four. Now we're in the days of computers. How, how could I make this really, really good? Well, I could put a million boxes of built computers and still let it go ahead and get this out, right? So, uh, everybody understands what we're doing here. So, the idea is so, here is kind of the theme of what we're going to do today. This is kind of our break into integration. What we're going to do is we're going to try to tackle this problem. Uh, uh, Finding area under 
area under a curve by approximating it. And then we're going to do something to pass beyond just the approximation. But the first thing that I might ask is it turned out in the first, in, in Cal 1040, when you did things like find tangent lines, it turned out that although that might seem like just kind of some silly math problem, we saw that there were lots of applications to this because this reflected the way it changed. Why would we want to find area under a curve, right? I mean, other than just my mathematical curiosity, why do we care about this? Well, so let me give you an example. This is kind of a motivation. Uh, suppose I travel. At a constant rate of speed. Say 20 miles per hour. So, um, how far have I traveled after? Okay, it's silly for me to put this problem here, right? Because I bet you all can figure this out without me having to do anything fancy, right? How far do you travel in four hours? Eight miles, we're 20 miles an hour constantly, four hours per mile. But just for the sake, so we've got something to generalize. Draw this picture here. Now, my velocity here in this problem is 20 miles per hour. And my time, one, two, three, four hours. What is the area under this curve here? Well, the area under this curve, the curve is just y equals 20, right? It's a horizontal line. So the height is always 20, and the width is 4. This gives you 8. So notice, when I take the area under the curve of velocity, four hours, I get how far I travel. Does this work more generally? Well, so for example, let me give you one that's uh, uh, an example that's a little bit more than this. Uh, I draw up a rock. We have seen that distance falls after about ten seconds is uh In fact, when we did the antiderivatives section, we uh, I derived this. Uh, in fact, what I got was minus 16t squared uh, plus b0t plus s0. Well, so here, I'm starting, I'm just calling the building type zero, and I'm just measuring how far it drops. This is plus because it's actually falling away from it, right? Uh, this is the distance away from it that it falls. And my initial velocity is zero because it's I just let it draw. So, um, what's the derivative of this? Uh, this is 32t 
and the acceleration is so that means it's velocity after one second it's going 32 feet after two uh, I'm sorry 32 feet per second after two uh, seconds it's going 64 feet per second so so if I were to graph this thing, this uh t so if this is the information is given First five seconds. Well, we already know the answer to this. It's the problems that you're trying to record, etc. etc. It should be S5, which is 16 5 squared, which is 400. Now let's examine this. By the way, after five seconds, this thing will be going uh, 163. Now, look at this triangle in the area that is curved. What is the area of the curve? Well, this is a triangle, right? This is five. This is 160. The area, 1 half base is 24. So notice that the area under the velocity curve gives you the distance traveled. Right? There's something interesting going on here, right? Because think about what's going on. When you take the distance traveled, when you take its derivative, so you get the velocity. When you take the area under the velocity, you get back the distance. There's a connection. I mean, why do slopes and tangent lines have anything to do with the area of the curve? Well, we can see that. But so this is an important observation, and that is if you've got the velocity case, the area under that gives you the distance travel. I can go farther than that. Let's look at our acceleration. It was constant, right? What's the area under this curve from zero to five? Well, it's five wide, 32 high, it's 160, which is the velocity right at five seconds. So there seems to be something going on backwards here, right? Like right? when you take uh, position, the slope of the tangent is so distinct, it's telling you velocity. So this tangent is telling you acceleration. And the area under the curve doesn't reverse. So this is something that's important that needs to be investigated. We need to flush this out here. So what I'm going to do today is I am going to talk about how to get areas under a curve for at least some specific type of cases. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to start off 
with, uh, so we're going to need this uh, to help us out. Uh, sigma notation. Um, what? So I'm going to sometimes do this. This is a shorthand way to write a So, for example, well, let me do this via example. One plus two plus three plus four plus five. Plus uh, 100. That's what I'm just writing. And this notation, the Greek letter, this is the Greek letter of sigma, sigma sun. I have a counter, k equal one, and then sigma. Okay. So, what this notation means is. Just go through this. K goes from one to one hundred, right? K starts at one, ends up at one hundred. We have K, so you have K is one, K is two, K is three, K is four, and you're not done until you K is one hundred. And the sigma means add all the junk up. So it's one plus two plus three plus four plus four. So uh, some other examples. You add this. What's the pattern here? Right, I, I'm adding up odd numbers, right? So, two K plus one. Uh, where would K start? Good, zero. Right? Because when I plug in zero, I want to get one in that part. Zero, and then one gives me three, and I plug in two, it gives me five, and so forth. When am I done? Because the last one needs to be 101, so that means it came up to 50, two times 50 plus one. Right? Um, so for example, you might have something like this. Sign. Uh, five plus sign. Four five plus sign. Nine five. Sign sixteen five. By the way, uh, every time there seems to be a sign and a five, and see if I see the pattern, or see if I see a pattern of what I'm doing. That's right. It's a square of one, square of two, square of three, square of four, etc. Same thing. I'm just saying the same. Thing. I might write this as sum sine of k pi. Oops, I'm sorry, k squared pi, where k starts at one. It keeps counting up one, two, three, and it ends up at equal. Right. Okay. This notation will be useful a lot. You'll see it a lot uh, here and in uh, 1080. So here's some properties. 
like the sigma notation. Uh, number one, uh, number one. Anybody guess what I'm going to write? This can be written in several steps. Right, because of my weeks on that. Because you can write some separately. Two. Anybody want to guess this? So I have a constant, constant A1, constant A2, constant A3, all the way up to constant A. So if I have two A1 plus two A2. Plus. What can I do with that too? I can pull it out. So basically, this says you can write you can write sums out separately. You can pull constants out. This is an a five. Okay. Here's some specific formulas. We're going to need these in the exercises. Uh, three. The first one's kind of a warm up. Okay, think about what this really is. My formula is one, right? So this is one. So what, what does the sigma notation mean? It means one plus one plus one plus one, plus one, and how many times do you add one to itself? Well, k from one to n. This is like your count, like when the umpire like checks, strikes and balls. This is your count, k from one to n. One plus one plus one plus one, n times. So what do you get? You get one to itself, n times. How about this one? This is one plus two plus three plus four plus five, all the way up to if I know what this one is. Square. This is one. This is one plus four plus nine plus sixteen all the way up to n squared. This is n times n plus one times two n plus one over six. This one is the sum of the parts in cubes. This is actually going to be important, some of the stuff that we did. By the way, I will give you these formulas for free. Uh, but you need to know if they're out there using. We're going to use these in a moment. So, for example, in formula five, let me just run an example. One plus four plus nine plus 16 plus 25. Well, for this formula, this is formula five. 
with n equal to what? Five, right. So the formula tells me that that should be five times six times 11 over six, which is 55. So let's check this 25, 41, 50, 40. So work with that. So, and I'm, I'm going to show you why the, other one is true. Add this up. This should be done. Okay, let's see what that's true. There's a famous story about how many of you have heard of Gauss? Who will give two things? Gauss is law, you know, flux, and so forth. Uh, considered arguably the best mathematician of all time. So there's a funny story about when he was. Uh, in uh, school, you know, this is back in the days in Germany uh, in the 1700s, and they had those little slate chalkboards that everybody did their work on. It's a chalkboard, it's a slate. And so the teacher wanted to make the kids leave them alone, make the kids turn over, who knows. And so he told his class to add up the numbers from 1 to 100. This is going to keep them busy, right? Uh, after like two seconds, Gauss walked up with the solution to this. The teacher dismissed him. You know, I didn't even look at the solution, but it turned out that he was right. Uh, added up the first two numbers. What's the answer? It should be 5,000. How do you do that so fast, right? This gets very tedious. Well, mathematics is often an observation. So this is what I want to find out. I write S for some. This is really what I do. I'm adding one and two and three all the way up to the end. And something I want to know what that is. Adding them up like this, which comes natural, one plus two is three, and then adding them three is six, and then four is ten, that's very natural, but it's very slow. You can also write this this way. Right? I agree with that. Same set of numbers, but it's part of the first order. So this thing should have the same system. Now, add up the columns, so to speak. Let's just add these two. What's S plus S? It's two S's. What's one plus N? What's two plus n minus one? It's also n plus one, right? What's three plus n minus two? It's also n plus one. n minus two plus three. Now, how many of these are there? There's the n of them. So this is n 
times. Now, divide by two, and I get n, n plus one. And hence, this one. The first line was Gauss figured this out uh, when he was the first right? So that's not too shabby. Any questions? Okay, so these formulas you can have to pray, and we're going to use them in a moment, although it might not be completely clear how we're going to use them. It's going to come up presently. Any questions? We get out of this. Okay, so here's here's the deal. We are going to assume that uh f of x, so And for today, I want to make sure I'm talking about area. So I'm going to assume that my function is actually a positive function. That is, it's something above the axis that or below. So when I say area under a curve, what I mean is I mean the area between whatever the curve is and the x-axis. Something like that. Now, suppose I want to find the area in this curve. Now, I am going to take on the philosophy that uh, I'm going to break this up into Break up the interval from A to B into smaller uh, intervals. Uh, let's say we're going to call this x0, x1, x2, x3, and x4. xk minus 1. XK, X in minus one. So the idea is instead of looking on this long interval, I'll break it up into small pieces. And to choose a point. In the interval from xk minus 1 to xk, um, say x to the star, to term. This point could be anywhere inside there. So, for example, I'm going to choose this to be. X one star. I'm going to choose this to be X two star. I'll choose this to be X three star. X four star. And what do I mean by choose to determine height? Well, I'm going to put boxes in here. Remember how I put boxes under the curve? When I put boxes under the curve, I need to make a choice. How do I determine height? Well, so x1 determines the height of this box here, so it goes up and reads how high that function is and draws this box. x2 is the left hand endpoint of this, so it's going to use this point to determine its height. x3 appears to be almost right over here, 
So it's going to come like this. X4 is right in here. So, so like the X case star is somewhere in here. And the same box. I didn't draw all the boxes, but you all see what I, I did. So what we have is basically these points in here determine how wide each box is. Notice I don't assume that they're all uniform displays. Notice this one's flatter than this one. They don't have to all be the same size. They've all got these widths. And once you have a width of a box, you need to, to get an area, you need to determine the height. And so I've got to pick a point in there and use the, the red function to determine the height. Everybody okay? So we say we say is a partition. When you hear the English word partition, you should think of something that, that breaks it up into different pieces, like a, a jigsaw puzzle. You take a puzzle and it breaks it up into pieces. That's what this partition is. It breaks up the interval from A to B into the smaller little ones, right? So now we have the smaller intervals, x0, x1, x1, x2, x2 minus 1, xk, and x2 minus 1. This is our, well, our partition of the interval a, b, smaller interval. The width of any one of these is called delta x. And what is the width? How would I measure this? So here's that interval right here. There it is right there. How would I measure the, the how wide that is? That's right. That's exactly right. So, for example, if I said, how wide is that? What would you tell me? How wide is this little piece right here? Two. This x coordinate minus this x coordinate. And that's delta xk just means a change in the x coordinate. That just measures the width, I guess. And the width is one parameter that I need to find the area of the box. It's how fat it is. Width. And the height point, point xk star is chosen in the interval. To use What do we do? We choose some point in there. That's based on that. And how do I determine height? Well, 
What did I do to X A star from a time? You plug it into the function because the function above the X axis is red thing. That's going to tell you how tall that I've chosen this box. So the area of this box is F of X K star. That's how tall it is. Times delta X K. That's how wide it is. Height, width, that gives me that area. Everybody agree with me? So, total area of boxes. It is F X one star delta X one. So that's the first box. F X two star delta X two. Height of the second, width of the second, plus uh, F X N star delta X N, all the way to the last. And gosh, this is so much easier to write this way. My, this notation is much easier here because this just reads my counter. Fx1 star delta x1, there you go, plus fx2 star delta x2, there you go, and you keep going until you finally get to fxn star delta. This thing is called a Riemann sum. It is any sum of this form, f of something plugged in times a little width. <laughs> and actually, it doesn't just have to be positive function, but we'll get to that. This is called the Riemann sum. Any sum of this form, f of something plugged in times a little change in x is called the Riemann sum. And this is our approximation Or area under code. Uh, like such things from a Okay, so what I've done here is I've set this thing. So basically, this is a simple idea, really. It's a simple idea. If I want to approximate this area under a curve, just do it by boxes. This is the height of your box. This is the width of your box. Fill this up with boxes. So you're going to have a lot of problems in your homework tonight where it says to be the three months on. Um, all you're doing is measuring height times width, right? And some of these problems can get a little bit tedious plugging in numbers, but I think, you know, just kind of think about these problems and work on them uh, to get kind of uh, uh, smoothed up. But does everybody understand what we're doing so far? Is everybody with me on this height times width getting the box? Okay, approximation. Approximation. I don't know if I can get it. Answer. So here's my question. Philosophically speaking, how can I make this approximation better and better? But I mean, maybe I'm unsatisfied with my approximation because I'm a lazy, lazy man and I don't use four boxes. How can it be better? It might be better if I use 16 boxes. Now, I might not want to put it there. It might be better if I use 64 boxes or 8.7 billion. 
to suppose happens is that if I have more and more of these boxes, it gets all thinner and thinner. It gets closer and closer to the actual area. This should be maybe a familiar thing. You remember back when you first started finding, trying to find sorts of tangents? What did you do? The first thing you did is you reconciled yourself with, okay, I, there's nothing that I've done in trigonometry or algebra that will allow me to find the tangent line to y equal x squared at the point you know, 2, 4. Okay. So what did you do? You did a second line. Remember doing that? And you made the second line get closer and closer, right? The two points closer and closer. There's the same sort of kind of idea going on here, right? This approximation is the analog of the secant line. It's not exactly right, but I can make it as right as I want by making those boxes, making more and more of skinnier, skinnier boxes, right? Because there'll be less error on the boxes, smaller and smaller and smaller. What was it that makes calculus different than algebra and trigonometry? that allows you to do um, things like take derivatives, come up with what the actual sort of thing like, it was taking a limit. Really, the, the idea of a limit gets a lot of traction because the only difference between calculus and everything that you've seen in math up through high school up before then, it just this notion of limit. It comes up and allows you the derivative, and there's lots of applications, but really, it's just the limit. You've got the same thing going on. I can make my approximations better and better. And there's some kind of limit intuitively will make this a little bit stronger than what. Intuitively, what that means is I have more and more skinnier and skinnier boxes. And as I have more and more skinnier and skinnier boxes, this looks more and more like the area. Everybody ever get that? Now, let's actually do so. Uh, so for computational purposes, this is what you want in general, or well, in general. To get the framework right, you need this. For computational purposes, I'm going to take some shortcuts. So, let me do a couple of computations. Let's actually figure out some approximations and some areas. So, uh, from now on, today, uh, we will make some simplified assumptions. Okay, so you all are aspiring engineers and such. Let's look at let's look at this framework. Now what I did right here is mathematically very good because I set this up in a general framework, right? Uh, and you need this. You need to make the mathematics, to put it on concrete, to make sure you need to make it general. However, you all are engineers. So let's pretend that this works just for now. We're going to show later that it does. Let's pretend this works for now, this idea of smaller and smaller boxes. Now, you all be practical engineers with me. What can we do to simplify this and make the process better? There's two things that jump out. So what do we do? There's two things going on when we make these boxes. We need their width and we need their uh, height. How can we make the widths easy? What's that? First point is correct and then and what? I mean, so if you're trying to find the Well, right. But see, notice, are these widths all the same? I'm going to get a different number to it. This one's a little bit bigger than this. This one's smaller than this. This one's smaller than that one. They're all over the place. What's one thing that I could do that might make computing things a little bit easier? Why don't we make all the widths the same? Right. Okay, that's one thing that I can do. Maybe simplify. I'm going to 
Uh, so this is what you want in computation. What's something else that I right? Okay, so if I make these all if I make these all the same width, that'll make things easier. What's what's the other thing? Yeah, the other thing we need to do is determine height. And of course, we've got to use the red function, right? Because that's that's the play here. What's what, what's one thing that we can do about determining? Right, right. I, I, I use X1, X2. They're, they appear at random in that interval. This one's like, you know, maybe uh, maybe a fifth of the way across. This one's all the way over the left side. This one's all the way over the right side. This one's uh, two thirds of the way across. Let's make it uniform. So choose each XK star as right in. Uh, you know, XK minus one, XK. Do that. This actually gives me something that works well. So so let's try this forward. Here a couple examples here. Let's try this for the following example. Hmm. Fine. Area under one plus two X. Um, yeah, thank you. Now, the first thing I want to do is I'm going to answer the question without doing all this. Because really, you know what I'm doing is I'm doing kind of a I'm doing kind of a test case here. Because I know I can get the answer to this one. Because what can you say about the function? It's a line, isn't it? So let me see. Let's see what the answer is. One plus two X. That's a line of slope two. So let me see here. One to three. At the point one, this should be at the point one three. Right? And at the point three, this should be uh, three seven. If I agree with So I can figure this out. What I what I need is I need this whole area here. I'm going to break this up into a couple of pieces. Let's see what I get. Now this piece down here is a rectangle. What's the width of my rectangle? The width is two and the height is three. So the area of this rectangle should be six. Agree? And this is a triangle. Uh, the width of the triangle is two. And what's the height? Looks like it's four. So this is four, two, so it's half the base times the height, so it should be four. So it should be it should be ten. So I know what my answer is going in, and that's that's good because this will make sure that my process is good. Okay, so let's see what we're doing here. I don't have to really draw this function, but do it here. This is one, this is three. And I am pretending that I have uniform space. So 
we have n uh, subintervals. Each of length What should the, the width of each subinterval be here? Well, so n can vary, right? So how wide is this? Too wide, do I agree with that? And how many pieces have I cut it up into? In. So if it's too wide and I cut it up into n equally spaced pieces, each equally spaced piece should be what? Two by five. If I agree with that. So this is easy because there's no delta x i. The delta x is always the same. Every one of these to a room. Now, here's where my test points are. X one star, X two star, X three star. Because I said I'm picking all of them at uh, the right end point, right? Okay. Everybody okay with that? So, what's X one star equal to? So what's the x coordinate right there at the first right end? What's the x coordinate right there? One. Everybody agree with that? One's right there. And how far did you move from one? One where? Everybody agree with that? What about X2 star? <clears throat> we moved over two widths. Right? What do you suppose this is? One plus six over in, because now you moved over three widths. Am I okay with that? See what's going on? Okay, anybody bold enough to give me what you think the general form of this? With the first, I move two widths, second, two widths, third, three widths. What do you suppose this one is? One kick it up to change it. Now, my Riemann sum, my area is approximately equal to my Riemann sum. Let me remind you what that handbook was. Now, let's put this to use with our current situation. My XK star, let's shoot fire, I got that right here. This is one plus K to the O. And what's delta xk?
they're all two over. So remember, these are the widths of the little separate intervals. They were all the same in all two over. Uh, that's a dot, I'm sorry. So it's f of this times two over n. Okay. All we got to do now is uh, plug in. Let's see. Recall that f of x one plus two a. So this rule here is something times two over n with that sign. Okay, replace x by this, and I get one plus two of uh, one plus k times 2 over n. That's my rule for my function. Wait, okay. Okay, now we're going to move with this a little bit. This is, this is the worst kind of part of this. It's not too bad. Just have patience. Let's see. This thing here is, this bit right here, is 2 plus k times 4 over n. If I multiply this through, so I get 3 plus um, 4 over n times k times 2 over n. This is sum one six plus eight over n squared times eight. Now I'm going to use one of my properties here. Sigma, to split this up into two chunks here. This is Okay, any questions? Okay. Anybody see a way to simplify this? Actually, a nice formula for this. I remember what this is. One plus one plus one n times. This one's an n, right? So this thing right here, this sum is n. Anybody remember what this one was?
So this simplifies further. What's six over n times n? And this right here, one power of n cancels and I get eight times n plus one over two, which is, I get six plus, uh, oh, n plus one over two. Uh, and this is going to be uh, four. This is a beautiful little formula because it gives it, it tells you exactly what the approximation is if you have in boxes. For example, if you have any one box. One box you can run into. That approximation is six plus four times uh, two over one. So it's going to be 14. If I have two boxes, it's going to be six plus four times three halves, which is six plus uh, six, which is 12. So we've already dropped the 14 to 12. If you have a thousand boxes, six plus four times a thousand and one over a thousand, or 1.001. Right? So it will be 10 plus 0, 0, 004. Anybody want to guess what the actuary is? Get the exact answer. What's this limit here? N plus one over n gets n goes to infinity, goes to you can use Logan Tau's rule, or you can multiply top and bottom by one over n if you like. Either one goes to the board. And this is six plus four times one, which is that's exactly. Now, you may be a little bit disenchanted with this in the following sense. That's a lot of work for some something that I did very quickly. I, over here, I did this very quickly. Why would I go through all this crap? Well, I'll tell you why. Because now I'm going to do one that you can't do without something extra like a limit. Example, find area under y x squared So, y equals x squared looks something like this. Um, six, thirty-six. So what this problem is asking, find this area of the curve. Now, I don't have a good way to check myself like I did before with this guy for the time, right? So let's do this one. The first thing I want to do is I want to get an approximation. I want to get that three minus sum. 
So what do we do? We break our interval. It goes from zero to six up into n sub n, and evenly spaced to sub n. Okay. Okay. I'm breaking the interval from zero to six up into n equal in space pieces. Uh, What's the width of these things? six divided into n pieces, right? By okay. Okay. One, two, find XK star. Well, let's see, x1 star. It's going to be right there. Where it is that? What's the x coordinate? I, I, I like the way you put that idea. Zero. I got lucky and started zero here. It keeps it open by one wheel, right? X2 star is at the right end point here. What's that going to be? Well, you kick over by two wings. You're close. Well, kick over by three wings. Keep going. So we can How about XK star? Good. Zero plus. Yes. So, height of the box. There's your, there's your XK star. This is what you determine height. And you plug this into the formula. Everybody okay with it? And what is my formula this time? Well, I recall here that F of X is the X squared. So this comes out to be K squared times 36 over n squared. With our k box is um, 6 over n. We found that over here. Okay, let's see what we can get for our approximation. Our beam on sun. Yeah. Sun, our area is approximately F of XK star, delta XK. And we've already figured all this garbage out.
F base K star is this thing. Delta XK is So, this is some any one uh, two sixteen. Um, well, this is one of those things that really fits in four. When you sum for the n squares, the n, n plus one, two n plus one, all over six. So this allows me to replace this with this. Get a bit of a mess. This is two one six times n n plus one n plus one over six. Now I can cancel some stuff. Right? Uh, Six cancels to sixteen, leaving thirty six. And one power of n can cancel here. So I have n plus one times two n plus one over So this gives me again a formula, right? So for example, if you have one box, n is one, and this is 36 times two is three over one. So that's gonna be 72 times three, so I get 16. Uh that's the bit. But if n is like, I don't know, say two. Quite a bit better. Uh, 36 times 3 times 5 over 4. Um, so that's going to be 9 times 5. It's 26 times 5, so it's 135. A bit better. If n is 2,000, better. That's not going to get 2,000 equal to space boxes. So they can calculate the big amount. What's the actual answer? What's the what's the area of this? I have to figure it out. So here's what we have. So let's collect what we've got so far. Area under y equals x squared. Uh, with n uh, uniform space boxes and 
and using my endpoint from height, we get the area is approximately equal to 36. Over and square. How do you make this better and better? Or more boxes. Right? What's the limit as this goes to in goes to infinity? There's a way that you can just look at this and tell me the answer should be 72. You want to know that very So here, here's here's why this works this way. You could multiply this out. So let's do that. So let's see, that's going to be two n squared times 36. So it's 72 n squared. Then I'm going to have n plus two n is three n times 36. This is 108 n plus 36. Which I can write this way. Okay with that? And I think when I write it this way, it makes it a little bit more clear. What happens is it goes to infinity. This and this goes zero. Ready? But how did I read 72 off of here? Let me show you all a trick, which I will give you a lot of latitude. You can use this trick if you want, because we're already doing a little bit. Let me do something here. I want to do a sign of Uh, somebody tell me real quickly uh, what's uh, the limit this is in this room. Let me ask you this. So here's a, so here's the, here's the trick that, that I, I use for this. What is the biggest power of n that you see on top? Oh wait a minute, though. You've got to multiply that out. So when you multiply it out, would everybody agree the biggest power you're going to get is four? What is the so the biggest thing you're going to get on top is an n to the four, right? And what's going to be the coefficient of the n to the four? What's you think? It's going to be two times one. It's going to be uh, two times one to four. It's going to be eight. And then there's other garbage. Right. What about the bottom? What's the uh, what's the biggest power of any thing? You should also get a four, right? Because you get a cube coming out of this, and then one. What's the coefficient of the n four times? Because the coefficient of the cube term here is eight, and the coefficient of the end of one term is three, and so you get four. So everything else is lower, everything else is lower. As n goes to infinity, these are the dominant powers, you should get eight twenty-fourths, just one third. And that's exactly what I did here. If you look at this right here, only it's simpler. The biggest power on top is two, right? And the, co uh, and the coefficient of the square term here is 2 times 1 times 36, 72. The biggest power uh, down here is 2, uh, and you get uh, 1. So it's 72 over 1. Now, uh, be careful because this to work, 
you have to have a tie. The biggest term on the top and the biggest term on, on the bottom, they have that same. But does everybody see how I did that first? That's a little shortcut if you really want. And of course, this only applies when it's going to take a bit of infinity. Any questions? What's the That's exactly the problem. The biggest power on the bottom is six. And the biggest power on top is one, two, three, four, five. Right? So this is zero. Let me change it up a little bit. And What is it now? Yes. What's the biggest conceivable power you can make on the top? Yeah, you're right. It's going to be one third. Would everybody agree the biggest power on top is the fifth power? Right. Comes from the square here, the first power here, the first power here. Right. What's the coefficient of the n five power? Six. Okay, it's going to be five, or it's not going to work. We've got two coming out of here. Two out of here, one, so it's five. What a, what's the coefficient of the n five term on the bottom? Nine times two times one is eighteen. Okay, let's do the quiz for the day.